Teresa, like, what are your, so come over here and um, stand there. You gotta stand there, like super, super, super close. Yeah, no, even closer, it's cool. It's your, really? No, it feels really weird, yeah. but. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, this is not weird? No, no. Okay. It looks, it looks perfect, it looks good, right? Yes. It's, it's totally an ESPN angle, you know? I like People that. standing like really, really close together. I like it. Taylor has been remote, and but he was in the home office and then now works back in the home office. Oh man, this is real up close. Yeah, right? Yes. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. We are at Bad Camp 2014, and it's been pretty superb so far. How's yours been? Oh, it's been fantastic. Back at, still at, Bad Camp 2014, which is amazing. Taylor, how's your Bad Camp going? It's going really well. My first trip out here, so and I'm, I'm really enjoying so, it. It feels like it's, um, you know, there's so many people here. There's 15, 1,600 people here. It's like the, the third DrupalCon, you know? It's, uh, yeah, I love it. I've been several times, and I'm always, I always look forward to this. Yeah, there's a lot of people here that I've met before and, and seen in other places, so it's, it's a great event. Introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Taylor. I work for Four Kitchens uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm a front-end developer and graphic designer for them. I'm Matt Grell, uh, engineer at Four Kitchens. Uh, I am a remote employee. Uh, I love JavaScript and I build big websites. How did you discover Drupal? Do you have the first Drupal memory? Uh, I do. Um, I was working at an ad agency in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we were building a website for uh, the, the downtown coordinating council, and they wanted the ability to have a website where users could submit their own business listings, post events, um, and uh, have all of that searchable on one consolidated calendar for users. And that was something that I was having a really hard time building in other platforms. And a friend of mine introduced me to Drupal and said, this will get you a lot of what you want, just with site building, even without a lot of custom code and development. And so that was a really quick, big win for us. This is a really important concept that you touched upon. Drupal is the only system of significant complexity in our space where the fundamental design decision is empower the person on the UI, empower the site builder, empower the site administrator to be able to click together really, really, really powerful applications, writing no code at all or a minimum of code. Um, and this is this sets us apart. This this um, and this allows us as Drupalists, right? When we write the code and set put this all into a user interface, this allows us to empower all sorts of people around the world. Anyone who can get a, a web server up and put Drupal on it, right? Mm -hmm. They can go to town with this, even if they're not PHP developers. Yes. And I really think that that's, that's very powerful and, and it gives us a lot of great efficiencies. Um, but that, that's one of my favorite things about Drupal. How did you discover Drupal? What's your first Drupal memory? Uh, I was working with a previous client and they wanted to add more functionality to their website instead of just a bunch of static HTML. And Drupal was the best fit, uh, most free features. When was that? What was your first uh, version of Drupal? Uh, seven. The seven point is that we started right in 2011. That was my first time doing Drupal. And what's made you stick with it? Uh, the community. Uh, everybody's really fantastic. Uh, it's nice to work with, uh, with a lot of people that are very smart and know what they're doing and are always willing to help. Why did you stick with Drupal? Um, I started to notice that I could build more and more complex stuff, and as I started to learn how to build my own modules or build at least small pieces of code, I could do a whole lot more very quickly. And having a really robust content model allowed me to make sites that I knew we could expand later uh, in future phases of development. So I really liked that organization and that complexity, um, but still being able to provide a really good administrative interface. What's your favorite thing about Drupal? Whew. Um, I don't know, probably the content model um, and, and how robust that is and how we can add custom fields and store very detailed pieces of information. Right, D very complex data modeling in the UI. Yes. Super complex business logic with, with, with rules, with um, all of the different trigger, action, calculate possibilities. Um, and I think for myself, 
the ability to take all of that, slice it, dice it, mash it up with views, and then um, export that as web services, as whatever. You know, it's like a digital business building interface. I love right. That. So you're at Four Kitchens. Yep. You work on a team. You're remote. Mm -hmm. Some people are in the office. How many are on your team, and, and how many of those are remote? On my current team right now, uh, there are one person is in Austin, one person is in Germany, and two of us are here on the West Coast. So basically, everyone is remote from each other. What are the sort of things that you have to do to make that work? Uh, we started doing these audio-only hangouts. Uh, it's kind of like water cooler, uh, where we can just kind of chat uh, about what we're working on and learn, you know, what everybody's doing that's not necessarily work-related while we're working. I mean, you get a lot of keyboard background noise, but uh, it's very helpful to sort of keep the communication going. Oh, so it's an ongoing acoustic connection between you? Absolutely, yeah. We just, some of us put on our headphones, others just let the speakers fly and uh, just, you know, you can chat, you know. Oh, that's great. So you can be spontaneous with each other. Yep. It's Don't always have... on. So That's great. Communication as a remote employee is really challenging. I find that I have to, to over-communicate to uh, so most of the people I work with are on location together mm -hmm. in Boston, and I'm in Germany, and so I find I really have to write an extra email, make an extra call, point out what I could do, what I did, just to, just to keep things in balance. Sure. We, uh, yeah, the synchronizing the offline and online communications uh, has been an ongoing challenge. Uh, how do we transition those conversations that happened like in the actual physical office, like in the break room, to those of us that are not there? And uh, we use HipChat. Uh, it's a great tool to communicate. And so uh, we've really like embraced that. And so a lot of our conversations happen in this sort of like, water cooler. HipChat. So you have written channels going on, audio channels going on. There's a lot of communication. Definitely a lot of communication. So I think we've made it really good progress going forward. Or what did you do remotely um, in your personal day to make to make sure you got through and, and stayed productive and stayed happy and took advantage of, of not being in the office? Um, I Sometimes I would work from home, but I also made an arrangement with a local nonprofit to share office space with them uh, in downtown. And so that having to drive into downtown, I made that my goal for the day was to get dressed, get ready to go, and I went to work, even though I was sharing an office with a company that I didn't work for. Um, it was a destination. I would go, I would sit at my at my desk. Right, and the space. appropriate behavior for that place is yes. work. So right. then you go heads down and you do that, and then you, but you get to have lunch with people, you, you, you get mm -hmm. out of the cave for a while. Right? It was to be around other people. Um, and when I work from home, and because I do that a lot now, I, and I did uh, still when I was full-time remote, I would work from home a little bit. And what I missed most was having people around, even if it's not people I'm working with, just the, the, the human interaction was nice um, in those breaks. What do you need to do in your day at home or where you work to keep yourself on track and, and you know, productive, happy? I will pick up a task that I'm working on and just like said, I'm going to say I'm going to work for two hours, just like solid on this task, and then take a break, you know, and work in like very defined chunks of time. That makes it very easy to get, you know, what I need done. And then not try and like pick one task and then say, I'm going to work all day on this, because then you, you lose focus as you're going on. And so if you segment your time in very short amounts, that can be beneficial. Definitely. I mean, I'm at home, and so there's all these additional like tasks and responsibilities that might come up with being at home, like answering the door for packages being delivered and stuff like that. And I will kind of just shut all that out and ignore it when it's happening until I can then condense all those activities down into like a half an hour, 45 minute break in between a large chunk of working. Sure, a lot of people I talk with about being remote have, have imposed some, after some amount of time, they've imposed some discipline on themselves. I will always start at 8.30. I will always put on pants. <laughs> You know, um, I will not answer the door yeah. until three o'clock. Like, that that seems to really help people. Um, replacing the discipline of of going to an office somewhere, being among your colleagues. It, you know, Four Kitchens has always had a pants rule. So, <laughs> um, you know, wear pants in the office, please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I was working in a big office before I started working remote, and uh, I just kind of kept that same schedule. You know, I wake up, I take a shower, I have breakfast every morning, and put on pants, obviously, and I just start working. It's not a, I don't like staying in my pajamas all day. It's, it feels like you. Okay. So. 
we were talking before when we were setting this uh, conversation up about remote working. Mm -hmm. You've worked in the office in Austin. You've worked remotely. Yes. I believe you're back in the office right now. Yes. Just talk about the difference between a, re a remote team member and being in the office with your team. Um, there's a lot more organic or accidental conversation that happens when you're in the office and trying to replicate that um, digitally, remotely was uh, challenging at first. Uh, when I first went remote, um, I, I felt really disconnected for a little while. Um, we had just hired uh, another remote employee, um, Matt, who you just spoke with, and he'd been at the company for a couple of months and he'd talked to me about, as you go remote, you're gonna notice this lack of communication and having, I think, a second remote employee at the time, um, it got everybody to remember, oh, we're, you know, Matt and I are out there and you should rope us into these discussions. Um, we started using HipChat around that time. We started using Zoom meetings around that time. Uh, we started using Hangouts more often, and it became a very natural thing for um, employees to say, hey, let's let's have a video chat about this, um, because the the face-to-face -face communication, even if it's not in person, um, fixed a lot of those boundaries. There's a, there's, a, there's a rule out there, there's a saying, and I don't know where it comes from, I could look it up, um, you know, always choose the highest bandwidth communication available to you at a moment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you can, full video, full audio, whatever, um, default to the phone, then, you know, make do with writing. Mm -hmm. But for me, uh, five minutes on the phone, um, as much as we love endless issue queues in Drupal and mm -hmm. open source people love the discussion and love like crafting thousand word emails, five yes. minutes on the phone will save hours sometimes. Will save hours of, of writing. And because I, I know I have a tendency to write really long emails and I'm working on that. Um, but those short conversations and the constant flow of, of text messages over uh, HipChat. Um, is that constant reminder of, you know, we're all still working together even if we're at partners. So what's the biggest advantage of being a remote employee? Um, I felt like it opened up more opportunities to work when I wanted to. Because um, if I felt like I could work from home or I was working at a different office, um, no one was really tracking when I was and wasn't there. And some mornings it's just hard to get going and I'd rather go outside and take a walk and then come back and, and start again. Or some, some evening you're feeling really motivated and, and I know I can get a whole lot done and I would sit at my desk and, and turn out a whole bunch of work for a project in the middle of the night. Um, and that kind of flexibility allowed me to work really productively and then flex my time to be able to do other things um, when, when I'd gotten all caught up. I, I contend that it's it's essential as a remote employee to work with your manager um, focusing on deliverables. Yes. But I promise that this week you will get the following things that, yes. you know, and if you're in an agile team, you know, of course, that, you know, keeping velocity of all that stuff. Right. But if you're delivering right, then your team doesn't have to know or care where when you where, are right. or if you're doing it at two in the morning or if you're doing it in Paris, right? Mm -hmm. so. So we'll write a post for this, and I want your top three tips, um, what you need to do to be successful as remote. But so far I'm hearing um, as much communication in, in many different mo as, mo mm -hmm. as many different modalities as possible. Yep. Discipline in your time. Yes. What would the third one be? Third one is probably something like, like over-communicate, like, uh, Send as much, even if you don't think the other person will find it valuable, send that information anyways. You know, and then they can potentially parse it at their own rate. You know, uh, when you're a person, it's easier to, like, auditorily just, just, like, remove that information, so. I don't know if it's a remote thing, but I find myself um, sending a lot of emails like, thanks for the talk we just had. We mm -hmm. talked about the following five things and agreed that these are the next steps. Send it, and it just becomes like a record. Yeah, and, and a reference point. Yeah, with HipChat, and like we uh, do a lot of back scroll reading. If you're not around, you can scroll back and see what's been said, and that kind of, uh, if you're, you know, very diligent about using like a text based chat system, you know, it can keep a record of that. You can kind of use that as a running log of what you've said. So we don't always send a lot of like confirmation follow up emails. Um, but it's a lot of this like text logging is very important and to be able to search that back. So. Cool. What are your, what are your <laughs> three tips for succeeding with uh, mixed, remote, located, co-located teams? Um, I'd say first, uh, 
make sure that everybody communicates in the same way. So if we have a, a video meet, or if we have a meeting where one person is remote and a couple people are in the office, everybody uses video conferencing. Those two people go to opposite ends of the office. They don't speak directly to each other because if everybody is on the laptop screen, that keeps everybody on the same level. That's great. So nobody has a, an unfair advantage. Right. Okay. Um, and then uh, keep it light. It's really, really easy for little annoyances or small problems to snowball into these big things, especially with the long emails and the text threads. Um, we've we've helps to keep things light with uh, video conferencing, um, talking. Uh, those audio water coolers Matt was talking about. Um, we also started using the most ridiculous Google Chrome plugin I've ever seen, uh, GitHub Selfies. So in pull requests, at the end of a comment, um, there's a button. It, this plugin adds a button to be able to use your webcam to take an animated selfie. And we make goofy faces in the middle of code reviews because it keeps that process light. Because in other, you know, otherwise it would be just constant critique on change this, change this, change this. This is wrong, you know. And that is a really bogged down process. And so that's how we kind of share that enthusiasm with each other. That sounds like fun. It actually is a lot of fun. It felt really, really stupid at first. And then okay. I realized the whole mood had changed. OK, plug in Chrome GitHub selfies. Yes. Nice. It's a lot of fun. It's I ridiculous, but you got you to gotta own that. OK, and have you got a third tip? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Great, thanks. Cool. Hey, thanks for taking the time Great. to talk awesome. with me. Thank nice you. to meet you. Great. And Do people still use that? Um, well, we stopped working together because they started hating me. What? How <laughs> bad? I know, I'm just kidding. Four Kitchens has always had a pants rule. So. <laughs>